Welcome to Sacramento Central Seventh-day Adventist Church, and thank you for joining us for Central Study Hour, wherever you are and however you are tuning in. We're so glad you're here. Each week you send in your requests, and each week, by the grace of God, we're here to praise and sing them with you. Um, our first song this morning is my first request from Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Candace and Sherman Isidore uh, from Valencia requested Hymn uh, 92, This Is My Father's World. Now, it might seem like the enemy has reigned over <laughs> the earth these days, but this song reminds us that in the beginning, God created, and it was good. Yes, the birds, the rocks, the trees, they're all music that God <sighs> gave to us. So let's sing this morning, Hymn 92, This Is My Father's World, the first, second, and third verse. seems off so strong. God is the ruler yet. It is his world. Why should we be sad? The Lord is king. Let the heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. Amen. Our next song this morning comes as another first request from Shillong, India. Uh, Armando Blessed Masi requests him 296, Lord, I'm coming home. Let's sing the first and fifth verse of him 296. If you 
you have a special request, please visit us at our website. Click on the Contact Us link on, at saccentral.org. Uh, make sure you tell us where you're from. Uh, we had our first request from Trinidad and Tobago and from India uh, as just a, a great sign of how far reaching the gospel is. So please tell us where you're from and of course include the hymn you'd like us to sing with you. Our next song this morning comes from our theme of humility. Now the progression of our songs, we talked about how beautiful the world is that we're living in now. And Lord, I'm coming home pointed us to um, our eternal home, yes? And this song is a prayer that reminds us that we must be humble in repentance in order to receive that eternal home. So as we sing, pass me not, O gentle savior, let that be the prayer of our hearts this morning uh, while singing the first, second, and fourth verse. 569. Pass me not, O gentle say. Dear Heavenly Father, Jesus, our precious Savior, this morning, Lord, please hear our humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass us by. We want to be with you. Humble us in your sight that we can be with you. Bless us this morning as we study, and bless Pastor Mike. In these things we pray, amen. Our lesson study will be brought to us this morning by Pastor Mike, our associate pastor at Sac Central Church. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Thank you, our choristers and uh, uh, Walter on the piano. Thank you very much. Good to see you all. Um, those of you who are watching as well, I'd like to welcome you to Central Study Hour. And uh, if you want a free CD or a DVD of this morning's presentation, you can call and ask for offer number 21512. Offer number 21512, call 916 457 6511. Or you can email CSH, that's for Central Study Hour, CSH at sexcentral.org. Well, we're on Lesson 12. These quarterly uh, themes uh, go quickly, don't they? Uh, we're looking at the humility of the wise. And there is a memory uh, verse in Matthew 5, 3 
that gets us started today. Words of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Um, in the introduction, I'm going to skip right down to the bottom part of the introduction. It says, this week Proverbs looks at humility, considering our situation, how foolish it would be to be anything but humble. And if we have a correct view of God, indeed, it should humble us. Uh, it really should, and we'll be kind of trying to get our minds around that this morning about what is God like. But let, let's go to Sunday. It says, who do you think you are? Have you ever heard that said before? Well, who do you think you are? Uh, that's been said to me, I'm pretty sure, uh, during times in my life, or if, or if not inferred, well, who do you think you are? Uh, <laughs> and it's a question that will never die um, till we're all perfect and we're all in heaven. And then the angel will say, well, not who do you think you are, but I know who you are. You came from that earth down there. You are the ransomed of Jesus' blood. But anyway, there's a, there's a verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 30, verse 3, and it says, <clears throat> excuse me, I never learned wisdom, nor have the knowledge of the holy, or you could put there, or a knowledge about God come back to that in a minute. It's probably true to say that most freshmen uh, in college or high school seem very aware that they're, that they're the rookies, you know. They're the, the new kids are on the block in their first year. And uh, I was there once, I'm sure you were all there at some time. And it's always nice to get beyond that freshman stage where you can say with some pride, I'm not a freshman anymore. I'm a sophomore. Well, as some of you probably know, such a title isn't necessarily a compliment uh, because it can be interpreted as wise fool. There's a compound of two Greek words, sophos, which means wise, and moros, which means foolish or dull. We actually get the word moron from that last Greek word, moron. So, uh, being a sophomore isn't necessarily something, at least the title, to boast about, right? Uh, but still, that aside, uh, a college sophomore does not have to necessarily be, um, you know, a wise fool as far as they are intellectually. Um, I want to leave college sophomores alone because I'm using this just as a springboard to discuss the fact that the greatest literal sophomores and the greatest literal wise fools are not found in schools and college. Well, yes, I said, but they're all over the place, right? But the greatest ones are actually found in God's church. Even, dare I say it, uh, among the leadership. Professing themselves wise, they became fools. Uh, why would somebody who is a Christian maybe in a, even in a high uh, position of leadership, what would cause them to be a sophomore, truly, literally, a wise fool? On one hand, they think they're wise, but really in God's eyes, they're just fools. Well, the lesson is talking about this this week. It's because they're self-righteous. And when a person is self-righteous, they cannot obtain a true knowledge of God, which in turn, as they grasp that, leads to true humility. Because you see, and you know this, a self-righteous person feels no need. They're self-satisfied spiritually, and unfortunately, they are blind to their own true spiritual state. They're, ju they're just numb to it. And somebody like that really has no desire or passion to get upon their knees, to fall upon their knees in true sincerity and, and, true sincerity and say, Dear God, please forgive me. Actually, the opposite tends to take place. You know, these spiritual sophomores, these wise fools, they tend to be quick to look upon others as lesser uh, lesser mortals, lesser deserving mortals in God's sight and undeserving of God's favor. 
Spiritual blindness is a terrible thing. Then you mix that with pride. You know, God hates human pride, and I've said this many times, both here and up there occasionally when I, when I preach. And, and Jesus told a parable. You remember the story? Uh, let's turn to it. It's in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. Jesus was talking about these two men in church. Here we are in church, not in a college setting, looking for sophomores. Jesus is going on a sophomore hunt to show you where the worst sophomores are, and that is in church or in the temple in his day. Luke 18, verses 9 through 14. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were what? Righteous. And they did what? Despised others. He said in verse 10, two men, two men went up into the temple to pray. The one a Pharisee, here he comes, high-ranking, got standing in the church, maybe works in the conference office, probably shouldn't have said that, but anyway. <laughs> or maybe he's your pastor in this church, so you can, you can look at me. So I'm not, I'm not picking on the conference, Pastor, Elder President Pedersen, please, I'm not getting at you. You should understand what I'm talking about. But there are people in leadership and even smaller positions. You can be a Sabbath school leader. You can teach the little kids in um, cradle roll. This can apply to you. Anyway, here's the Pharisee. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I am not as other men. That I am not as other men. And of course, he turns around here. Uh, as other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican here. So he had his eyes open while he was praying, right? He says, I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess, and we should. But is it gaining him righteousness? Let's, what, let's see what Jesus said. Verse 13. We look now, we get another camera shot, and we look at the publican. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalt, exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humble himself shall be exalted. This is why getting back to our memory verse, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Actually, I'll read that. Uh, Mike, if you want to pass me that there. Thank you. I'll read this little bit now from Mount of Blessing. This is a great little book, and it's on the chapter, Blessed are the poor in spirit. Just a little bit here. It says, He who feels whole, who thinks that he is reasonably good and is contented with his condition does not seek to become a partaker of the grace and righteousness of Christ. I just mentioned that. And I mentioned this. Pride feels no need. And so it closes the heart against Christ and the infinite blessings he came to give. There is no room for Jesus in the heart of such a person. Those who are rich and honorable in their own eyes do not ask in faith and receive the blessing of God. They feel that they are full. Therefore, they go away empty. Those who know they cannot possibly save themselves or of themselves do any righteous actions are the one who appreciate the help that Jesus can bestow. They are the poor in spirit, whom he declares blessed. Whom Christ pardons, he first makes penitent. I'm going to stop right there. Maybe somebody here this morning or somebody watching out there in live stream or, I don't know, YouTube sometime in the future. You may have fallen and you may feel so, so, so very wretched. And you may feel, you know, can Jesus forgive me? Uh, let me tell you, if you have that penitence and sorrow, understand that Jesus put that there. Get the point, whom Jesus pardons, 
He first makes penitent. So the fact that you feel penitent is evidence that Jesus has already pardoned you. But you need to ask forgiveness. You know, the devil will lead us into sin and leave us there trembling, thinking, how can I approach God? There's people like that. How can I possibly approach God? And yet, and they're sorry, but they have this picture of God like this, overbearing tyrant, and the devil puts it before their eyes. Understand this. If you have that penitence, Jesus is the one who put it there. So be encouraged and say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for being so merciful. Whom Christ pardons, he first makes penitent. And it is the office of the Holy Spirit to convince of sin. So if you're convicted of sin, it's the Holy Spirit working in your life. He hasn't forsaken you. I get calls maybe three times a year on average. Pastor Mike, I think I've committed the unpardonable sin. It's a scary thing if you think that. You know, I ask the people, you know, we can be afraid of judgment to come. Yes, uh, sure, there can be a fear of that. But do you feel sorry that you did it and you're sorry that you hurt Jesus? Oh, I do. You know, I just long for fellowship with them. You haven't committed the unpardonable sin. This is all evidence of Jesus working upon your heart to draw you back to his pardoning love and into his saving arms. So if there's anybody out there struggling with this, I hope this helps you this morning. Those whose hearts have been moved by the convicting Spirit of God see that there is nothing good in themselves. Publican was like this, right? But the Pharisee wasn't. They see that all they have ever, ever <laughs> excuse me. They see that all that they have ever done is mingled with self and sin. Like the poor publican, they stand afar off, not daring to lift up so much as their eyes to heaven and cry, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And they are blessed. There is forgiveness for the penitent, for Christ is the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. God's promise is, though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as well. And he says, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And it continues on here. Mount of Blessing, pages uh, 7, 8, and 9. Thank you, Michael. So, um, I'm glad I got to, uh, to, to mention that. Um, okay, I want to move on to Monday. It's talking about a knowledge of God. This is all what we're looking at today. And if you do get that knowledge of God, true knowledge, if you get a true knowledge of God, you get a true knowledge of yourself. When you have a true knowledge of God and a true knowledge of yourself, pride just, it's gone. There is humility that takes over, and it's a sweet, sweet feeling and a sweet experience. Um, Proverbs 30, verse 4. It says, who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is the name of his son, if thou canst tell? This is speaking of God. Can you tell this about him? Were you there when he measured the earth, when he laid the foundations of this planet? Uh, Michael, Michael here. Michael, would you please read to us, uh, what are we looking at? Job chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. Um, Job chapter 11, verses 7 through 10. And again, this is all part of this question. Can you understand God? Because if you can understand Him, you can understand where yourself and where you need to be. Okay, Michael, thank you. Job 11, 7 through 10. Yeah. Can you search out the deep things of God? Can you find out the limits of the Almighty? They are higher than heaven. What can you do? Deeper than Sheol, what can you know? Their measure is longer than the earth and broader than the sea, broader than the sea. If he passes by, imprisons, and gathers to judgment, then who can hinder him? Yeah. 
That's God. That's something of a view of God. I want to read another passage here. This is Romans 11, 33. And, and Paul is borrowing this, I, I believe, from Job. There's a lot in Job about God. A lot of questions. Makes you think. Uh, Paul says in Romans uh, eleven thirty three, it says, Oh, the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. That's why we have problems sometimes. We think things are going terribly wrong. When we're, not, when we're seeking to do God, that is, uh, seeking to please God, things go terribly wrong. We think, what on earth is happening? Well, nothing's happening that's going to be to your detriment. It's just that you don't get it, but God does. It says, how unsearchable are his riches and his, and his judgments and his ways past finding out. We can't always understand. We can't always enter into the counsels, the mysterious counsels of God. But you just trust him and know that he knows what he's doing. Uh, verse 34, for who hath known the mind of the Lord or who hath been his counselor? Well, nobody sitting in this church this morning, nobody was, not even the angels. But God is who He is, and I'm glad He is. And again, such views of Him will, will humble us. And out there in this vast creation, now who made it? God in Christ. Spake and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. And all these countless galaxies comprise of billions and trillions of stars. There are solar systems just like ours. And going around those stars are planets which are inhabited. And the Bible speaks about the inhabitants of the heavens. Revelation 12, it says, Whoa, to, uh, it says, Woe to the inhabitants of the heavens and the earth. Inhabit it's not speaking of angels, it says inhabitants of the heavens. It's speaking of beings on other worlds, on fallen beings. Uh, Job chapter 1, verse 6, I won't turn there because we don't have that much time. And Job chapter 2, verse 1, it speaks of the sons of God who came before God one day in council up in heaven. You're probably familiar with this. And Satan was there among them. God said, what have you been doing? He says, walking up and down in the earth. You know, I claimed it as mine. I got Adam to sin, so it's mine. So here I am. And so God allowed him, obviously, into some of these councils. But that's done now. Um, but still, he claims that he is the one who uh, is the God of this world. But still... It tells us in Job 38 that when God laid the foundations of the earth, in Job there it says, the morning stars sang together. Who are the morning stars symbolically? Angels. So when Jesus laid the foundations of this earth, all the angels, they all sang. And the sons of God, who are the sons of God? All these beings, not all boys by the way, there's girls as well up there. It says, the sons and daughters of God, they sang for joy. What a chorus. Because God, on this little, really insignificant-sized little planet, going around a quite insignificant-sized little star, had created down here a unique race of beings who are made in the image of God. Not angels, not beings from the planet, whatever, from whatever galaxy. We were unique. And this is why the devil had his sights on this, on this earth and upon this race to take this earth race down because we were made in the image of God. And when that happened, the morning stars sang together and the sons of God shouted for joy. You know, one day we'll see a replay of that. You know, we'll see a replay of those things. Who needs Hollywood? Who needs IMAX? Who needs a 60 screen inch TV? I mean, Cheap stuff. We're going to see it all replayed again Amen. across the heavens. Oh, the things that God has prepared for those who love Him, we have no idea. Just be faithful. Just be faithful. Cling to Jesus. You'll be there, and you'll watch the big movie one day. But it's quite a thought that after all those angels uh, and all those sons of God sang, sang and shouted for joy that this little planet where this race of noble beings became debased, defiled, and corrupted because of this wretched thing we call sin. And yet, it's the most 
a wonderful thing that in spite of that, even though we're so proud, we get a view of God and see how big he is, and yet we still have these proud hearts. And yet in spite of that, we're often in rebellion. God, he still loves us, right? I don't understand that. I've told him that many times. Look at myself. I said, Lord, I don't, I don't under, you're a mystery. Lord, there's things about you I understand, but there's some things I don't. But I believe in faith you love me. And I do. I believe that. And I'm thankful. And, and so in spite of how we are, there's this question we read in Hebrews 2.6, uh, which I'm going to read. And again, he's quoting from Job. Job said a lot. You know, If you haven't read Job recently, do that. The question is, Hebrews 2.6, what is man? And the ladies as well. What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him? Lord, it's a bit like praying a prayer like this. Um, Considering how fallen and decrepit we are, O Lord, do you, really, do you really take that much of an interest in us? I mean, do you really take that much of an interest in us? What is man that you are mindful of him? And Lord, why would you really want to associate with us the way that you do? But he does. Because God's never forgotten that time when he made this race after his own image. And God is possessive. And I'm glad he's possessive about us. And he lost something. And he wants it back. He wants it back at any price. And so he paid the ultimate price. In Jesus Christ, he poured himself out till there was nothing left, till he was all gone for you and for me. I'm glad God is possessive. If he wasn't, he would have just Oh, go on then, you can have them. No, he's jealous for us. And so I'm glad for that. And so the question is, Lord, what is man that you are mindful of him or the son of man that you visit him? Reasonable question considering how glorious and mighty he is and how small and kind of decrepit we are. But he does, and that's such an amazing thing. It's the reality, and I'll say it again, that the God who created us through Jesus Christ is the God who loves us so much and died for us in Jesus Christ. And those who receive him as Savior and Lord will one day live with him forever in the earth made new. We'll see that as well. You don't just see it. You'll be there. <laughs> Michael says he's looking forward to it. So am I. We, we, we just, you know, in those... Uh, um, in those wildest moments, well, if I can speak about prayers being wild, excuse me, don't you mis- mis- misunderstand me, but in those moments when you seem to kind of get a glimpse of the glory, uh, a, a wild sanctified imagination, and it gives you a thrill, even then is in, the, in those most lucid moments, we see through Coke bottle bottom glasses, you know, you know what I mean by that? And they're very dark indeed. But one day God's going to take them off. And we're going to see the whole glory of the whole, of the whole thing. And, um, and when we do, and now we get faint glimpses right now, and it's enough, and it should be enough to humble us. But when we see it, oh, oh. Uh, Michael, please, uh, the other book there, the, the hymn book. Uh, driving the church this morning, um, I had my uh, CD player on, and and uh, Helen said to me, what, what song is that? And, uh, well, she'd heard it before, but it was just a little snap. So I went back to the beginning, and it was when I surveyed the wondrous cross. And uh, I was playing that, and I said to my wife, Helen, my dear Helen, I said, I said that the words of this song are just so powerful. Um, I'll read you two verses. Um, when, I, when I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died. Now, we're on about humility, right? And how pride needs to die. When I survey the wondrous cross on which the Prince of Glory died, my richest gain 
I count, but loss and pour contempt on all my pride. Forbid it, Lord, that I should boast, save in the death of Christ my God. All the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to His blood. It's wonderful to be able to sing a song like that and mean it, right? And when we get that glimpse of the wondrous cross and how wonderful God is, and we can sing that song from the heart, and all that pride just drains out, and you humble and meek before Him, and you're joyous and glad to be so. It's a wonderful experience. And um, that's how God deals with pride. He humbles us. He doesn't knock it out of us. He shows us something far more better that we desire. And we see it all at the cross. And that's why it's a wondrous mystery. I'll read the other two verses. They're not very long. See from his head, his hands, his feet, sorrow and love flow mingled down. Do dare such love and sorrow meet? Our thorns compose so rich a crown. Were the whole realm of nature mine that were a present far too small, love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. Can you say amen? Beautiful. Thank you, Michael. So one day, um, because of the glory of the cross, we will follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth throughout this universe. It's in there, Revelation 14, verse 4, and they follow the Lamb whithersoever He goeth. And uh, God's, Jesus is going to take us on a tour of all those worlds. I don't know how long it's going to take. We're going to need forever. And He's going to take us to all those unfallen worlds to visit with all those unfallen beings who for... 6,000 years have been watching here. This is called the theater of the universe. You know that? All these beings for 6,000 years have been watching the theater of the universe. They know about God's character. They know about Satan's character. They know about us, and they've been watching it. And they've been seeing this whole thing play out. And they were there. They saw the cross. They saw everything. And so there's, there's so much more about God that they know that we don't. We see through a glass darkly, but you know, they can't wait to talk to us because for all they've seen it all, and they've watched it all for 6,000 years, they've never walked in the shoes of a struggling human being who needed divine grace, who had been tempted, who knew what it was in their nothingness to come and cling to the cross and there find forgiveness and cleansing. They want to talk to us, you know. They're so far above us. And you know, we, we may be tempted, as it were, to feel pretty special. Here we are on this big tour with Jesus. We're made in His image, and that image is restored. He says to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me on my throne, as I also overcame, and I'm sat down with my Father on His throne. We're pretty unique. And Jesus became one with the human race, not one with angels, not one with all those beings. He became one with us, and He still has that flesh. We're going to travel around with Him. We're going to land on those planets, and all the people are going to come to want to talk to us. And you know what? In human terms, if we were still there as fallen beings, we'd think, oh, bring on the paparazzi. Here we are. But we're not going to be like that, right? What are we going to be like? humble, meek, little children. And this being may come to you as head and shoulders. It's going to take us a while to grow up, and we will grow up, you know, and these beings are going to come, and angels are going to come. And so, you know, I, it just amazes me. I mean, and all we're going to do is just stand there like little kids and just say, well, I appreciate meeting you. 
It's nice to be here. But you know, if it wasn't for the fact I didn't have a loving daddy, I wouldn't be here. So I just want you to know that. You get the picture? So all this glory. We'll be able to stand it, but we'll be just so humble and meek, and we will never forget. Throughout all eternity, all our deformities are gone, but you know there's one thing that will ever remain to remind us. Jesus will always bear the scars of his suffering and his crucifixion. Yeah. Uh, we should probably move on here. Um, uh, a knowledge of God. Uh, when we reach the other side, as it were, and I'm not trying to sound like a spiritualist, uh, when you die, you sleep, okay? And you come up when Jesus resurrects you. Then we get across the other side of the river. But when we get there, we mix, uh, we see Jesus, and we see these beings and these angels. There's so much knowledge they're going to share with us as well. And the latter part of great controversy, I, I want to read this to you because it's just thrilling. It says, all the treasures of the universe will be open to the study of God's redeemed. Unfettered by mortality, they wing their tireless flight to worlds afar, worlds that thrilled with sorrow at the spectacle of human woe and rang with the songs of gladness at the tidings of a ransomed soul. With an utterable delight, the children of earth enter into the joy and wisdom. You see, this knowledge that we're talking about is going to increase. And they'll come and teach us as well. Now, that'll make us even more humble and more thankful to God. We will enter into the joy and the wisdom of unfallen beings. They share the treasures of knowledge and understanding. Tre share the treasures of knowledge and understanding that they got gained through the ages upon ages in contemplation of God's handiwork. With undimmed vision, the saved, they gaze upon the glory of creation, suns and stars and systems, all in their appointed order, circling the throne of deity. Upon all things from the least to the greatest, the Creator's name is written, See our understanding, what it's going to be like. We're going to see His name written on everything. And in all of the riches of His power displayed. And the years of eternity, as they roll, will bring richer and still more glorious revelations of God and of Christ. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence. So if our reverence increases... What's our humility going to do? It's going to be even smaller. But we'll be just so blissfully joyful to be as nothing that Jesus can receive all the glory. As knowledge is progressive, so will love, reverence, and happiness increase. You know, when, I first, when Jesus comes and I get on that cloud, I'm going to be delirious with joy. I'm going to be just totally delirious with joy. And I've read this so many times, it says here that we're going to get happier and happier and happier as eternity rolls. I can't imagine what that's like, but we're going to get happier and happier and happier. So you meet an old friend that you crossed paths with one million years ago. Oh, nice to see you again. How are you doing? I'm far happier now than I was a million years ago. And so it goes on like this. This is why I truly, this is not in the Bible. This is just a personal thought. I may have shared it before. If God, wants, would, if God were to allow us to experience that joy right now, it would be too much for us. It would overload our nervous systems. We'd just collapse. Boom. We'd be gone. We would. It'd be too much. Too much emotional. That's why he's going to have to make us new with this powerful, I don't know what, uh, um, one billion watt power proof <laughs> emotional nervous system so that when all this joy hits us, bang, we, we're able to take all that current and just rejoice. <laughs> oh, praise the Lord. Is it boring being a Christian or what? <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, <laughs> oh, dear. Um, the more men learn of God, the greater will be their admiration of His character. 
as Jesus opens before them the riches of redemption and the amazing achievements in the great controversy with Satan, the hearts of the ransom thrill with more fervent devotion and with more rapturous joy they sweep the harps of gold and 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands of voices unite to swell the mighty chorus of praise, Revelation 5:13. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that in them in the is heard I saying, Blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And can you say, Amen? Amen. 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 Well, I've got to move on. Um, Tuesday. Neither too much nor too little. Um, now, uh, we're going to read, uh, Larry's going to read, um, where's Larry gone? Here, here's Larry, here. Larry's going to read for us Proverbs 30, verses 7 through 9. Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Least I be full and deny thee and say, who is the Lord, or least I be poor and steal and take the name of the Lord in vain. Thank you very much, Larry. So, not too much and not too little. There's a lot we could say on this, but I'm going to focus actually just on verse 8, which uh, at least part of verse 8 says, remove far from me vanity and lies. And we'll get on to poverty and riches um, in a moment. Remove far from me vanity and and lies. Uh, how easily uh, do you suppose, um, if we're kind of a little slipshod in our relation with God and we don't particularly read the Bible as we should and grasp what it's trying to teach us or listen to His voice, how often do you suppose or how easy do you suppose it could be to maybe come to terms with the personal issue of our personal pride and vanity, and may I perhaps even say dishonesty? You know, we speak of little white lies. A lie is a lie, no matter what color it is, you know. Um, we need to be truly honest in, in everything. But, but first, um, yeah, I want to look at pride here. Um, Somebody may say, yes, I know, uh, I, I should not be so uh, filled with um, self-pride. I should ask God to give me a, a humble uh, spirit. But, you know, that's going to just be so crucifying to this proud and vain heart that I possess. It's going to hurt me. So, I, I'll fight that battle another day. You know, I, I, I know I should be humble. Listen. When we read in God's Word, and especially when the Holy Spirit comes as well to convict us, you are proud. Jesus loves you so much, but He wants to cleanse you from that pride. We shouldn't put it off, right? Like anything else, that we feel that conviction. Now, if self, you know, how you look is um, an idol, it doesn't mean you have to, if you're going to cut all your hair off, make yourself look ugly, you look nice. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't mean you have to wear rags. You know, it, uh, human beings, we can go to extremes. You know that? You don't have to go to an extreme. But if you need a more humble opinion of yourself, you need to... I'm not, I'm, I'm not looking at any woman. Uh, why would I pick on women? Um, I'm not looking at any woman in the church this morning. Thinking, this woman over here is overdressed. I need to say this just for her. No. No, I see nobody and nothing like that is coming to mind. But you understand what I'm talking about, right? If you feel, you know, I think I overdress a little bit, undress down a bit. Jesus can help you do that. He wants us to be humble and meek. So when we come to church, we don't come to church as it's a fashion parade. You go to some churches, you see that. Uh, sometimes it's a, not just a fashion parade, it's a parade of what's the I'm looking for? Uh, immodesty. We, we want to be humble and meek in God's eyes. And pride can manifest itself in so many ways. 
So where do we get rid of that? You see, you can't make yourself humble. Where do we find that humility? It's at the cross, right? You find that humility, as we've already looked at this morning, when you get a knowledge of God. You think, wow, all the vain things that charm me most, I sacrifice them to his blood. Just give Jesus that heart. He'll take care of it. Make it humble. Make it sweet. We can do nothing ourselves. But oh, how he can change us if we will let him. And then about the question of strict honesty. Remove from me vanity and lies. Um, well, you shouldn't lie, right? But if you, I, I didn't get the reference, but if you have the book Patriarchs and Prophets, uh, go to the chapter there, if you even got the chapter number, because I didn't get time to check it out. But where it's speaking of the Ten Commandments, there about on Sinai, and read what it says there about um, thou shalt not bear false witness. You'd be surprised in the ways that we might tell a lie, not even by opening your mouth, sometimes by closing your mouth, when you should say something that is true, but you don't. Even by body language, even by a gesture, even by an expression on the face, we can convey a thought into somebody else's mind that makes them think this, when really the truth is that. So, I'll say no more about that because our time has gone, but if you struggle a little bit with, you know, on your tax return. I saw a sticker on a, on a car, it says, don't steal, the government hates competition. Have you ever seen that? <laughs> so you may feel that Uncle Sam steals from you. But you know, when I fill in my tax form, even though the government may take my money and waste a lot of it, I still feel that I need to be honest. Um, okay, so let's return back here to um, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. And I, I think the thing that we can boil this down to is don't give me too little, don't give me too much, is just being content with what you have. Uh, John, Jim, uh, is going to read here a verse. He's going to read Hebrews 13:5. If somebody could um, give him the microphone there. Hebrews 13, verse 5. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Be content with such things. 1 Timothy 6, 8. For we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Philippians 4.11, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be, what? Content. God wants us to be content. And in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, it reminds us, but godliness with contentment is great gain. So, you may not have much, humanly speaking, you may you may could do with some other th some extra things, you know. God knows that, but if and He tests our faith. But if we can be content with what we have, that is great gain. And you know, I'd rather be in want and be dependent upon God and be content with that, rather than have too much, where I'm comfortable and I have no needs. And what does that do? Well. Make you less dependent upon God, right? It kind of speaks for itself. But godliness with contentment is great gain, whether you have a lot or just a little. Wednesday, we'll get a tiny bit of this one. In the actions of the arrogant, Proverbs 30, verse 13, there is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes, and their eyelids are lifted up. Now, I've already said a lot about pride and vanity and so on this morning, so we don't want to um, be too uh, repetitious here. But in the lesson on Wednesday, if there's time, we've got 51 seconds left, I want to read this statement, and it's from Faith and Works by Ellen G. White, and it's related to Laodicea, who feels that Laodicea has need of nothing. 
It says, here is represented a people, Laodicea, who pride themselves in their possession of spiritual knowledge and advantages, but they have not responded to the unmerited blessings that God has bestowed upon them. They've been full of rebellion, ingratitude, and forgetfulness of God. And still, he has dealt with them as a loving, forgiving father deals with an ungrateful, wayward son. They have resisted his grace, abused his privileges, slighted his opportunities, and have been satisfied to sink down in contentment. In lamentable ingratitude, hollow formalism, and hypocritical in sincerity. Now that's a pretty strong statement, right? There's a lot of stuff in there you could unpack. But this is speaking of Laodicea. And who is Laodicea? It's the last church in that whole period of uh, time periods, and we're the church of Laodicea, along with every other church and denomination that exists. But one of Laodicea's problems is spiritual pride rich and increased with goods. There is, getting, there is a need again of getting that glimpse of God. And when we see how great He is, then we see how small we are. Then we sense our need. And in humility, we go and ask forgiveness. We ask Him to take our lives, to take our hearts, and to change them into His own moral image. Well, uh, I want to thank you for uh, looking in today at Central Study Hour. We trust you will join us again next week at the same time. And uh, we can give you, we will send you a free uh, CD or a free DVD of this day's presentation. It's offer number 21512. And if you call 916-457-6511 or csh at saccentral.org, we will send one to you. And God bless. We'll see you again next time. Bye-bye.